my name is Linda. I'm a children's book author. I'm an illustrator. I'm a pretty mediocre Ruby programmer, and I think this is the thing with us humans. We contain multitudes. We can be many things at the same time. Computers are binary. They can be on or off, one or zero, pass electricity or don't pass electricity. But we humans can be many things at the same time, and that's the beauty of us. As mentioned, my career has been all about introducing computer science to people who don't necessarily fall in love with it in the same way as everyone here in this room has. And the thesis I started with is the idea that if code is the new universal language, if our children are going to be learning English and Chinese and JavaScript, and God bless them, in school as their first foreign languages, instead of grammar classes, we need more poetry lessons. And what I mean with that is the idea that in the same way we don't learn a natural language only by conjugating irregular verbs or practicing different nouns, we learn a language by speaking it, by singing it, by flirting in it. And even though computer coding is not a natural language, I think the ways we teach are much too um, narrow. And with that in mind, when I started to learn programming uh, roughly 10 years ago, I would have all these books, these computer science books that were thick and dull and gray and full of text. And I would like go through them. And even though the language I was learning at the time was Ruby, which really made my heart sing, I would still run into all these acronyms like, what is object-oriented programming? What is garbage collection in my, uh, mobile development? And I would try to imagine how a six-year-old girl would explain these abstract concepts. And that's how the project started, as little like drawings and illustrations in the margins of my computer science books. And something in my brain at that point irrevocably switched, because you know how there's people who see numbers as colors? I started to see the world of technology as stories. And I imagined if Apple was a character, it would be obviously the snow leopard, who's beautiful, but doesn't want to play with the other kids because they are just too messy. It only likes well-designed, well-defined things that it owns. And then there would be the robots, the green robots, and there would be a ton of them, and they would all look different, and they grow up a little bit too quickly, but for some reason everyone seems to love them. And that would be Google. And there would be Linux the penguin, who's really efficient and smart, but a little bit hard to understand at times. <laughs> and I would go to my mom and be, Mom, I want to drop out of university. I know what I want to do. I want to combine the world of software with the world of storytelling. And my mom tells me, Linda, that's a horrible idea. That sounds like a Soviet propaganda book from the 70s. <laughs> Why on earth should kids understand how big technology companies think and what kind of values they have? Well, <laughs> the reason is religions barely reach billions of people anymore. Governments don't reach billions of people anymore. But companies like Facebook, Google, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, they reach billions of people on a daily basis. And it really matters what kind of people we have behind those companies. So with that in mind, even though we live in this era of amazing opportunities to learn coding, everything from the puzzle-based activities of code.org to the open-ended playground of Scratch, my big question was, where do stories fit in this equation? Because stories, in some way, they've always been the way we humans have understood ourselves, each other, and the world around us. And no one was telling stories about the world of software. So I set out to do this. And today, the Hello Ruby books have been translated into over 25 different languages. And actually, rather than only speaking about coding, I've started to teach computer science for the smallest ones of us. So everything from a book about computational thinking to how computers work to how computers talk to each other, so what is the internet about? And finally, the newest book is about machine learning and how computers are changing our society, all for kids between five and nine years old. And today, instead, again, of coding, I think what I'm actually doing is I'm preparing kids for a world where many of the problems around us are actually computer problems. They require the work of the human and the machine together. Problems like nutrition, energy, education, health, all require a much more diverse group of people to see the potential of computers as tools of self-expression and problem-solving. But the challenge 
is actually linguistic. When we think about a biologist, we think that, oh, a biologist is someone who studies the biological world. And when we think about a physicist, we think that, oh, a physicist is someone who studies the physical world. But when we think about a computer scientist, we easily think that a computer scientist is someone who studies the computer. But we couldn't be further away from the truth. Because a computer scientist is someone who uses the computer to study the big problems in the world. And turns out, more and more of those problems are computer problems. So my favorite quote comes from Edgar Dijkstra, who says that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. And rather than teaching mechanical coding skills or memorization for our children, maybe we ought to be th teaching them thinking skills instead. And it all starts with stories, as mentioned. This here is Ruby. She's a fierce six-year-old, very bossy, very imaginative. And when Ruby's dad tells Ruby, Ruby, well, it's not Yukihiro Matsumoto, by the way. Uh, when Ruby's dad tells Ruby that we're running late from school, Ruby, you need to dress up. Ruby, she dresses up, but she leaves her pajamas on because dad didn't specifically first tell her to take the pajamas off. And when Ruby is told that, hey, Ruby, your room is a mess, clean up all the toys. Ruby cleans up the toys. She puts the plush toys away and she puts the Lego blocks neatly in their right place. But she leaves the pens and papers on the floor because, hey, Dad, pens and papers are not really toys. And there's a chance that I'm raising a very obnoxious generation of kids. I apologize for that in advance, but I'm also teaching them something very profound about how to speak to a computer. Namely, you need to give very exact commands. Commands need to happen in the right order. Naming things is really important. And then the most important thing I want the kids to remember is the thing that computer scientists very naturally think, that even the biggest problems in the world are, in some ways, just tiny problems stuck together. And you can solve big problems by first taking them apart. So with that in mind, I was thinking of giving you sort of the principles of play, these ideas that uh, hopefully help you think about the future of technology and, and future of our world. And because I'm a storyteller, they come in the form of A, B, and C. And A, obviously, is for the algorithm. Now, I think everyone in this room feels pretty okay about algorithms. But if I tell this story to a bunch of teachers, they immediately think about the world of finance, they think about the Facebook. And normal people, they feel queasy around algorithms and scared. And we start with an exercise where I tell the people that, hey, you are the programmer, and this here is the computer, your pair, another human being. And your role as the programmer is to give instructions to the computer on how to wash your teeth and break part the problem into smaller steps. And this activity is always filled with laughter, making a lot of mistakes. People fail miserably in uh, defining what the toothbrush is, remembering the toothpaste exists, remembering to unscrew the toothpaste cap, and they start to have empathy also towards the programmer. <laughs> How many things you need to keep in your mind at one. But they also learn something very profound about the act of programming. They learn that it's actually a fairly good idea to strategize with the other person, to discuss your problem. That's called, in the industry slang, pair programming. They learn that making mistakes is such an integral part of the process of programming that we came up with a special word for it, debugging. No one writes perfect code at the get-go, and the rubber duck uh, debugging story always cracks people up. And then finally, they understand that programming is a lot more about creativity than rote memorization. Because when I ask people to perform their algorithms for toothbrushing, we hear a lot of different solutions. And I tell them some of these are more elegant than the others, <laughs> but all of these get the job done. And I think that's the beauty of programming. You can kind of play with it at many different levels. So in essence, they learn that an algorithm is a step-by-step -step solution to solve a problem. And if there's any uh, bakers in the room, I tell them that in some ways, recipes are a little bit like algorithms. They specify very um, carefully the steps to making cupcakes, for instance. Or if you need to give instructions to someone on finding their way to home, you're kind of working on an algorithm. But I bet a lot of you are now in the room kind of shaking your heads and being like, no, 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 that's cute, nonsensical, but that has nothing to do with the algorithms I work with. So here's an exercise I do next. 
I show the kids five numbers and I ask them to put these in the order of magnitude. And it takes them roughly 10 seconds. For these numbers, it takes them a longer time and they need to come up with a strategy of putting these numbers in order. And for these, even longer. The first lesson is for the kids, this is not a task you want to compete with the computer. Because a computer will always be faster at sorting different numbers, but it still needs uh, instructions to do it. And here's one way the computer could approach the problem. It would start from the beginning, it would compare 1 to 56, it would say 56 is bigger than 1, let's move on to the next pair. 56 and 4, 4 is smaller than 56, let's swap them around. It would keep going, 56 and 70 looks okay, 70 and 20, let's swap this around, and then it would move all the way back to the beginning, and this is called a bubble sort algorithm. A step-by-step -step instruction someone wrote years and years ago for the computer to sort numbers and a lot of other things uh, still in production today. But this is not the algorithm that scares the parents in the room. The algorithm that scares the parents in the room is the one that is invisible and hides everywhere in our lives and is slowly starting to define what it means to be human and be a part of a democratic society. So to kind of tackle that side of an algorithm, I show the kids a picture of a search engine. And I ask, where is the algorithm hiding? Like, you know, those books where you need to find the missing puppy or something like that. So the kids look long and hard and they say, the ads. The ads are defined by the algorithm. I say, yes, the algorithm takes into account your browsing history and demographic data and where in the world you are and tries to serve you the right kinds of ads. And also the, the order in which the results is shown is written by someone. So someone wrote instructions for the search engine to show you the right things. What about a social networking site? Ads, the kids know already, but also the kinds of updates you see, because the social networking site, it optimizes for retention, and the longer you stay on the site, the happier the investors. And then finally, I show them the YouTube, and I ask, where is the algorithm? Again, in the ads, and also in the next videos, the kinds of videos you get served. But not only those things, also the kinds of videos that are created, because the algorithms are so powerful on YouTube, and I bet if some of you have seen the kind of crap your children watch on YouTube, you would recognize that these videos are not made for humans. They are made for algorithms. And that's why you have things like the surprise Play-Doh eggs, Peppa Pig, Stamper Cat, Pocoyo Minecraft Smurfs coming up because the algorithm loves stuff like this, not the human. And this is the world we are worried about where computer science defines the kind of world we live in, and the humans don't have any, world, any more room uh, to say uh, what they believe in it. And that brings us to the computer. Uh, no, that brings us to the idea of computer science that I wish all of you in the room would embrace. This guy over here is one of the heroes of the world of pedagogy. He's called Jean Piaget, and he said that you can't really offer an entirely organized intellectual discipline only by giving the kids pre-organized vocabularies. But true learning is grounded in action. And that's why I think everyone in this room we as an industry, need, we need to come away from our high horses and start to explain these things in a way that they make sense for normal people. And since we are in Denmark, I wanted to show one chart from Lego that maps different motivations for play. And I wanted to ask the question, why is it that when we talk about playfulness in programming, we so often only talk about the achievement side of play? We talk about progress and power and gamification and accumulation and challenging others and domination. Whereas everyone in this room who has actually experienced programming knows that there's so much other joys in programming. There's the social motivation um, of helping others and making friends, of collaboration. There's the exploration, there's the joy of finding a new way of solving a problem, and at least for me, the escape from my real life problems. And what I wish to see a little bit more is us embracing as an industry all the different aspects of play when it comes to programming. And that requires us to ask questions we are not very used to asking. A computer science professor might ask a question, could you define to me what a loop is? I don't need to define to anyone in the room what a loop is. Rather, I would pose the question, how does a loop feel like? And this is a question a six-year-old can get excited about. And we practice this by having a dance party. So Ruby's favorite dance movement is this. She goes, clap, clap, stomp, stomp, 
clap, clap, and jump. And with the kids, we practice a four loop by repeating this sequence of dance movements five times. And we practice a while loop where you repeat the sequence of dance movements while a condition is true. So while I'm standing on one leg, the kids keep dancing. And then finally, as homework, they get the until loop, which is where you repeat the sequence of movements until a condition is met. So until mom gets really, really frustrated, the kids keep <laughs> dancing. And in this way, I'm hoping to take the kids up and down the different abstractions of co co coding and computing. Everything from the kinetic to actually going into Scratch or these other visual programming languages and building a loop yourself, then going into code and doing the syntax-based thing. And very importantly, giving also the context of why on earth am I learning this concept called a loop? Well, if you're making a game, odds are you need a loop that says, keep moving the hero until it hits the enemy. But these abstractions are hard because we adults spend so much time in our heads and these things are so familiar to us that we never escape our own abstractions. And that brings us to the V, which is for Boolean logic. And it starts with the idea that computers indeed are abstraction machines. I'm somewhat jealous to the people here in the room who grew up in the 70s because you could actually touch a transistor touch a transistor. For my generation, you can jam 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. But there is no way of understanding how a computer works anymore. The computer scientists, they've done wonders in the past 30 to 40 years. They've built layers of abstraction on top of each other to the point where we have these beautiful shielded machines, but no way of understanding how they work. And sometimes I wish I could shrink myself to the size of a silicone ship and really see how the computer works from the inside out. But unfortunately, with modern day physics, that's not possible unless you're a children's book author. <laughs> so that's exactly what I did with Ruby. One day, Ruby is really bored. She goes into dad's office and she types her password into the computer, but the computer doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the white mouse next to Ruby, it wakes up and says, oh, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor. Can you help me find the cursor? And Ruby says, oh, of course, I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And together, they make themselves really, really small. They notice a small mouse hole at the side of the computer and they crawl in and they fall deep, deep, deep inside of the computer to the layer of the electricity where there's billions of tiny switches. Ay -ay. <laughs> Let's see. Where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off on and off. They either pass electricity or they don't pass electricity. And Ruby says, I think we could find the cursor here, but it would take forever. So up we must go. And they go up to the layer of the logic gates that take these tiny bits and do a little bit more complicated math mathematical operations with the bits, but still really hard to follow and understand, and they ask really bad puzzles. So up they must go to the layer of the hardware, where they meet the processor, the bossy professor of the computer that does a lot of calculation and a lot of commands for everyone else, but is really forgetful, so it needs help from the RAM and the ROM and the hard drive. They even get to meet the GPU that is in charge of showing stuff on the screen and has a new fancy role as someone who does a lot of complex parallel calculations for the new shiny things in technology. They meet the operating system and finally they also do find the cursor. I'm not going to spoil how, you'll need to read the book for that. But I think more importantly, they get this sense of computers as abstraction machines. They learn how electricity turns into logic, how logic turns into hardware, how hardware turns into software, and how software turns into the apps and programs and games we use every single day. And hopefully, as a result, they realize that while computers are magical, they are not made of magic. They are made of logic. And I think that's a big distinction in thinking. So a question I like to ask with kids is this. What do they think is inside a computer? And I promise you, 
if I was to give each one of you a paper here, you would have wildly different answers for this question, even though you all are computer engineers and you know what you're thinking and, and doing. And I've asked this question from a few hundred kids around the world, and I've received some marvelous answers. And very broadly, you can group these different answers into a bunch of bigger groups. So there's always kids who imagine that inside of computers there's content, which is a very sort of obvious idea. They imagine computers as content, uh, uh, content containers full of apps and games and videos and files. Then there's kids who have this very abstract idea of a computer. They imagine computers as these inter-networked components, and I think these are the future computer architects in the making. They're scanographers, kids who explain these elaborate stories and metaphors around how computers work and how each one of the different components has their own uh, job. And these kids are obviously very close to my heart because this is the way I understand how a computer works. There's even gear gurus, the kids who imagine that inside of a computer there's tiny gears. And even though there's no gears inside of a computer, I think they grasp something about the idea how the simplest part of a computer does a fairly simple thing, but together, when you combine them, they become more and more powerful. And then finally, there's the drafters, the kid who, kids who draw the, the different components. They draw the transistors and resistors and wires. And I think all of these metaphors are what we need to explain what a computer is. Because a computer can take a thousand forms and have a thousand faces. And this is the last generation of kids who will remember the computer defined by its screen, defined by its keyboard, or defined by its mouse. The next generation grows up talking to the computer, and their abstraction and idea of a computer it will be wildly different than the one you and I use. So computers as abstraction machines, and teaching what a computer is for a generation of kids who won't grow up with the same idea as we have. And in order to do that, we need to really understand what a computer is. I show kids four pictures. I show them a picture of a car, a grocery store, a toilet, and a dog. And I ask the five to nine-year-olds, which one of these is a computer? And the kids, they object. They say, Linda, are you completely bonkers? None of those is a computer. Computer is the glowing box in front of which mom or dad spends way too much time. But then we talk, and we figure out that actually a car is a computer because it has a navigation system inside of it and all kinds of other systems. And grocery stores, boy, do they have computers. For instance, when you walk into a grocery store, there's a sensor that recognizes if you're walking in and opens the door. There's the ice cream machine, there's the cashier's machine, there's the burglar alarms. Dogs might not be computers, but a dog might have a microchip inside of it, so you can follow it if it runs away. And a lot of kids talk about robot dogs as well. And this comes with a warning. If you have small kids, don't tell them this, but I tell kids in Japan, toilets are computers. You can kind of see, like change the, the rim and the, the heating on that and program different kinds of music. And there's even hackers who hack the toilets. <laughs> and this is just way too wild for the children. Nothing else gets discussed for the rest of the day. <laughs> so we figure out that there's hundreds of computers in every single home, because your microwave is a computer, your remote controller is a computer, your doorbell is a computer. And next up, I give the kids a little sticker with an on-off button on it. And I tell the kids that for this afternoon alone, you have this magical ability to make anything in this room into a computer by placing this little sticker on it. And I've collected them these everyday items, like a tuna can and a lipstick and keys and a book. But my favorite story is a little girl who's chosen a bicycle lamp. And she comes to me with the bicycle lamp where she's put the little on-off sticker on. And she tells me, Linda, if this bicycle lamp was a computer, we could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent. And this bicycle lamp could also be a movie projector. And that's the moment I'm looking for. Not the moment when the kid understands the difference between hashes and arrays in Ruby or writes a perfect if-else statement in JavaScript. The moment when they understand three profound things that we adults have a hard time remembering. First of them is that the world is not ready yet. 
There's so much we haven't invented or discovered yet in the world of technology, and the world is not ready yet. There are so many things. The second thing she learns is that technology is a wonderful way to make the world a little bit more ready because it scales and it creates wealth around it. And it's been always the way humankind has moved the civilization forward. And the final thing, and maybe the most important one of them, is that for a moment there, she felt like she could be the world's first computer, um, movie projector, bicycle lamp innovator. And that is something that kind of self-efficacy and self-belief is something I think we should be safeguarding in our children, but a little, bl little bit also in ourselves. So how do you explain what a computer is for a generation of kids who won't recognize it by the keyboard or the screen? In order to do that, we need to go all the way back to year 1945 when John von Neumann came up with the von Neumann architecture for a computer. At a time when computers were bigger than this hall, now they fit into our pockets, but the basic principle is still the same. A little bit simplified, what von Neumann said is that a computer is any device where you input information, you process that information somehow according to the rules you write, and out comes the modified information. So this means when you go on Facebook and you like something, in goes the information to the server that someone has liked this post, out comes the updated like count. But this is also true when you sit in a car and you forget to buckle your seatbelt. In goes the sensory information that someone has forgotten to buckle the seatbelt, out comes the beep, beep, beep noise we all hate so much. And at this point, kids say, oh, this is boring, let's do something. So we build a paper computer, and some of the kids are the input data who crawl inside of this paper computer. And there's a little piece of code written there, like come out jumping on one leg, or come out crawling the opposite way. And then they become the output data, and they go through the input process output so many times and so quickly that the computer eventually ends up breaking down. But again, they have a very physical experience of the very foundation of computers. Computers. And this is important because I think far more important for the future than having the ability to code is having a very robust idea of a notional machine, a very, very, very robust mental model of what a computer can and will do, what humans are good at and what computers are good at. And this brings us to the final uh, letter, which is C, and it is for creativity and computers. So here's the thing. I bet many of you have read the recent articles and stories about AI overtaking pretty much everything. And for normal people, this is devastating news. This is like a medieval monster has been summoned from the ground up, and they think of the Terminator, and they think of the Skynet, and they panic. What kind of a future will we have if the computer takes all the jobs? And luckily, 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 most kids don't worry about this stuff. But there's always a few kids who come to me and say, Linda, what will I do when I grow up if the computer takes my job? And I think it's really, really important to give the next generation an optimistic and pragmatic idea about AI and machine learning so that they don't fear the computer. And when I think about AI, I explain the kids that it's all about data. It's actually one kind of technology that is getting applied to a lot of different problems and industries right now, not many different kinds of AIs that are being generated at the time. And all of a sudden, there's much more data in the world, because every time you click something online, you generate a piece of data. In China, they monitor like a lot of stuff with sensors, and that generates a lot of data. And that data gets packaged and delivered into products. And the challenge with data is that usually people's eyes glaze at this point and they feel scared, but I think our role is to make data a little bit more acceptable and understandable. And rather than speaking about AI as something that is close to humans, I try to explain to the kids that actually what we're talking about here is machine learning. And it's the thing where we give computers humankind abilities, things that used to belong to us humans only, like the ability to see, to move, to communicate, to reason, and maybe even to create something new. But they all have specific technological terms, like seeing is called computer vision, and communicating is called natural language understanding. And the way a computer does this is by using lots of data. It's no closer to what makes us human, what makes us special and unique, our soul and our perception of the world than it was 70 or 80 years ago. It's all about data and computing power. So in the past, 
if we wanted to solve a problem like this, is this thing here a cat? The poor programmer would write lots of rules for the cat. It would say a cat is an animal with two ears and a tail, and it would come in these five colors. And these rules would be really brittle. They wouldn't take into account the complexities of the real world. And the results were not very good. Nowadays, what we do instead is we give the machine lots of examples of cats, tens of thousands of examples of cats, and we allow the machine to come up with its own rules of recognizing a cat. And at this point, I tell the kids that, you know, Google, they taught a machine to recognize a cat by watching 10,000 hours of YouTube videos, and the kids do this. Why is the computer allowed to do that and not me? <laughs> So the problem is stated by the human, and the computer gives the answer. The human gathers the examples of cats, the computer builds a model out of these cats, and then gives an answer to the question. And actually, it doesn't even give an answer, it gives an estimation of the likelihood of uh, this thing being a cat or not. And we humans are still needed at interpreting these results and deciding whether they are accurate enough for our needs. And this whole process of gathering data, building models, and answering the question, it can seem like a black box. I hate it when people say that AI is black box, but it's not that. I think we as an industry have a responsibility to explain these concepts like they were explained for a six-year-old, not only for the six-year-old, but for the sake of the adults too. So building a model, it's not a black box. You can explain that reinforcement learning is like a computer optimizing for a certain, prob uh, certain goal, or that supervised learning algorithms are when you give a computer a lot of examples of apples and things that are not apples, and this kind of data is pretty sparse and, and there's not much of it, but it can be very powerful if you have it. And that unsupervised learning algorithms, there you give a jumble of data for the computer and the computer starts to find the patterns itself or that a neural network, uh, you can just look at the different objects here and, and look at each of the layers of the network and calculate how many of the different things it has and, and through these kinds of things make it more approachable and, and more accessible for people who otherwise feel fearful and frightened about AI. And the area where I would spend most time is the data gathering phase, because let's face it, not all of us will be the ones building the models for the AI, uh, but I think a lot of our jobs will be related to the gathering of data. And for that, I have an exercise like this. So I show kids four pictures of cats, and I ask, what is the bias the computer learns if they want to learn the concept of a cat only by looking at these four pictures? And the kids for look for a while and they say, oh, that all cats are gray. I say, yes. And all cats have blue eyes. I say, yes. And all cats have pointy ears. I say, yes. There's also cats that don't have pointy ears. And now draw a picture of a cat that is a different color and a different shape and different look. And what about here? If we want to teach the concept of a teacup for a computer, what is the bias that the computer is learning here? that all teacups have handles, that all teacups have handles on the right-hand side, that all teacups come in one, well, without patterns. And now draw a picture of a teacup that has a pattern and has a uh, handle on the left-hand side. And these examples are quite innocent. They don't make us threat, uh, like too, they don't make us um, stay awake at night. But what happens in a world where we slowly start to automate more and more of our systems around the world, and it's only the California boys that get to decide what kind of problems get better and solved. In that world, it might be easy to forget that not all nurses are women. And it's these problems, I think, we are going to see, uh, where we are going to need most radically more diverse group of people to get excited about computer science. So again, I would out, like underline the idea that while AI is magical, it's not made of magic, it's made of logic. And if we want to think about the self-driving car, which for some people can be wildly perplexing and scary even, we can explain that what a self-driving driving car is, it takes input as car camera data, and there's a process that maps the position of other cars, it recognizes with the image vision thingy, and then the output is the ability to drive. Nothing more complex than that. And I think in a world where these kinds of skills are more and more around us, the number one thing I would teach for kids is the ability to realize what humans are good at and what computers are good at. 
So as one exercise I like to do with kids is this art machine activity where each one of the kids gets an algorithm. By this point, they are not afraid of algorithms anymore because they know that it's a step-by-step -step sequence to solve a problem. So they know that an algorithm might be to draw a blue circle. An algorithm might be to draw a red triangle inside of each blue circle. An algorithm might be to con connect the red triangles with a green line. When I turn this computer on, in roughly 20 minutes, the kids have gone round and around and around the big piece of paper. And they've created this beautiful piece of artwork. And we all observe it for a while and we say, oh, whoa, how beautiful is this? And I ask the kids, oh, by the way, how long would you think it would take a computer to generate a piece of artwork like this? And the kids calculate and they go, oh, there's 10 of us and it took us 20 minutes, so maybe 200 minutes because there's only one computer. And I tell them that, you know, a computer could probably generate 100 million of these in a microsecond because this is exactly the kind of task a computer is good at. It's good at repeating sequences of instructions over and over again faster than any human ever who could. But how does this artwork make you feel? And a little girl raises her hand. She goes, Linda, it makes me feel very busy. <laughs> and another one goes, oh, it makes me think of summer vacation we took with my family in Greece. And I say, bingo. These are things computers are not very good at. Computers can't offer interpretations around artwork based on their own experiences. Computers are not very good at motivating us. Computers don't console us. And I think the jobs that are really future-proof are the ones where we recognize what kind of tasks computers are good at and what kind of tasks we humans are good at. So with that in mind, whoops. So with that in mind, it might be that our children won't be learning programming by writing sequences of instructions for brushing your teeth. Maybe they will learn programming by collecting examples of tooth brushing. It might be that our kids, uh, instead of going to the um, dentist's office, it will be an AI that searches for the cavities, uh, because that's a task an AI is wildly better at doing. And the dentist's role is more to console the child who is fearful. It might be that the future farmers will have far better image recognition software to help them get the bugs out. And that leaves the question, what should the farmer then do with all of this time that has been left uh, over? And what I worry about the most is that AI is being only seen as a tool of optimization, efficiency, and maximization. And it's used purely in the business setting. And what would make me the most happy is to see a wildly more, radic a wildly more diverse group of people embrace AI as a tool of self-expression and problem solving. This story comes from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, which I bet many of you know, uh, the, the author behind uh, The Little Prince. And he has this famous part in the book where he draws a picture of a boa snake that has eaten an elephant. And all the kids go, oh, that's a boa snake that has eaten an elephant. How scary. And all the adults say, it's a hat. And at this point, Antoine feels very uh, like disappointed. And he says that, why would I talk to someone who only sees a hat about the wild forests and, and the uh, boa constricts or, or stars? I should talk to them about the golf and politics and bridge and neckties. How sad is that? And I figured that, okay, this is the dynamic between an adult and a kid. But in an ideal world, what could the dynamic between an adult and an AI be? So I showed this image uh, to the Microsoft image, uh, like Vision API, and it said this. I'm not really confident, but I think it's a close-up of a guitar. <laughs> And I think this is the future of AI, where computers can give us a radically different perspective into a problem we thought we knew already. And it requires, again, us humans to be a little bit more curious and creative when it comes to the applications of our technologies. Another story comes from Finland, where I originally come from. Uh, one of the most famous companies in Finland is called Marimekko, that does these like, very bold and colorful textures. And the founder, Armi Ratia, was a very revolutionary woman back in the 70s. She said that Marimekko could equally well have been a fun fair or a flower shop. She just wants to project her inner world. And sometimes I dream if 
Armiratia had the reach of Linus Turvals, if, if we could merge these two famous Finns together, what kind of a software world we could have ended up with. And I got a chance to experiment with this. So last fall, I built this little neural network where I fed a thousand four ex 1,400 examples of different Marimekko clothes names. So they have this very unique way of naming clothes, like Unikko and Jokapoika and Tasaraita, the Finnish impossible language. And the task was for the neural network to look at these names and try to generate new Marimekko names. And I was really excited and pumped about this project. I found the open source library, and when I went to sleep, uh, when I put the computer on, it took a few hours for it to run the first version, and the results were so bad. <laughs> they were things like valos, inislö, lahnilitantti, ikkäkunit, onasot. And I was so sad and disappointed because I felt, is this the future of computers and creativity? Not a very promising future. But then I decided that, okay, the computer has only been looking at these examples for four hours, and it still needs to master the language of Finnish, which is impossible as a language. And I decided to give it a little bit more time. And I went to sleep, and in the morning I wake up, it feels like it's Christmas morning, and I have a Tamagotchi again, and I go to see what the computer has created for me. And in eight hours, the results were much better. The computer had generated names like Pyynin takka, Tano halti, Putti, Pukukka, Tirkka, Ruitin tulla. And even though you wouldn't understand a word of Finnish, you can start to hear that these sound like real joyful words. It actually caught a lot of like the Eastern Finnish Karelian vibe that is really hard to kind of capture. And I show these to the Marimekko creative team, and they go completely blank in their face because they thought that this is the stuff that humans are good at, the creativity, the naming of things. And I tell them that don't worry, there was like three or four thousand names generated, and I still was needed as a human to curate and decide which ones were going to be chosen. But I hope that you guys will also see AI as a colleague, as a kind of sidekick that has a very different perspective and can help you surface new kinds of ideas. So, in my opinion, the next big thing, it's not going to come out of Silicon Valley. It's not going to come out of one monoculture. I hope that it's going to be coming out from the back streets of Danish small cities or from African villages or from, like, I don't know, uh, like, Asian little girl's imagination, and it will be as colorful and diverse and imaginative as the world itself. And when I think about where I draw inspiration, um, there's this uh, little tiny, tiny Italian village uh, called Reggio Emilia. And in the 1960s, they realized that they had completely destroyed a whole generation of kids with the fascism and the world wars. And they needed to come with a different kind of way of teaching kids. And instead, and they, they built this municipal early childhood education system, but instead of writing a strategy paper or instead of coming up with a vision, they wrote a poem. And the poem is called The 100 Languages, and I think it's especially resonant for a group of programmers. Because they say that a child has a hundred languages. The child has the language of sculpting, of painting, of crawling, of dancing, of singing, of programming. But so often we adults tell the child that there's only two languages of reading and writing. We tell the children that science and imagination, sky and earth, reason and dreams, work and play don't belong together. But luckily the child knows that we have a hundred languages. So with the hundred languages, I think as a metaphor, I think I want to take us to the very ending. And I think there's a world where there's a reason why we need to have this, mul this multiplicity of different languages. A few months ago, I read this article on The Guardian that told a story about Oxford University researchers who had two stacks of pictures. The other stack included natural items like plants and animals and, and trees, and the other stack had Pokemon species. And by far, the British kids were much better at recognizing the Pokemon than the natural items. They had more vocabulary to describe the Bulbasaur than the Badger, more for Pikachu <laughs> than the Birch tree. And the researchers were worried because what happens in a world where we don't have language to describe what is happening around us? 
And I worry about that too. I worry about what happens in a world where we don't have seven different words for snow and we lose this ability to describe things around us. But I also worry about a world where the same exact thing is happening in technology. We have a lot of words, also in this room, that we throw around like suitcases. And like suitcases, they pack a lot inside, but let very little out. Words like blockchain, Bitcoin, algorithm, <laughs> cloud. And I'm not sure what happens to a democracy if we never open those suitcases. And it also requires us to rethink the metaphors and explanations we use. Once upon a time, there was a little boy who came to me and said, Linda, is internet a place? And I go to him, no, 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 internet is not a place. It's an interconnected network of computers. It's like the information superhighway. It's like you go surfing there on the information, and I realize, oh boy, I sound like a 90s kid. That was my internet. This kid has never pressed the disconnect button on the internet in his life. And his metaphor of internet will be radically different. So should I start to explain to him that the internet is the fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to space? Or the server farms that are starting to store our very identities around the world? Or should I tell him that, no, no, Internet is the protocols that define how the data travels around the world eight times in a second. Or rather, should I explain to him that, no, no, internet is what happens, the explosion of creativity and cat videos, when six billion of us are connected to one another. And I think this is the challenge with teaching and talking about technology. We're not only talking about the hardware, no, we're not only talking about the software, and we're not only talking about the societal impact technology is having, we're talking about all three at the same time. And this requires us to have much more uh, diverse tools to talk about these things. And I want to end up with a new kind of defi definition for technology. One built on humanity, one built on the idea that we contain multitudes and we and computers and technology are never far away from one another. As the previous presentation mentioned, being a computer used to be a profession. Uh, it was a profession in Victorian era England for people who were really good at calculating long series of numbers like powers of two or square roots at an era where there were no calculators. And in some ways, I believe that the very last computers in the world will again be humans. And when we think about the word technology, today we think about the computer, and we think about being technologically literate. Some of us think about social media skills, some of us think about coding skills. But when we think about it a little bit in a little bit bigger scale, we realize that, wait a minute, combustion engine was technology in its day. Bicycle was high tech of its day. And we don't know what the future of technology will look like. Now it's a computer, but we know, don't know what the next iteration will look like. The only thing we have going for us is the definition. And it comes from the Greek. And it says that technology is tools needed to do a job. But not only the tools, also the techniques, skills, and competencies we humans bring into the problem-solving equation. That means that we humans are always interlinked with technology. And I'm going to leave you with a new definition of technology that comes from a nine-year-old girl. I asked a group of kids in Helsinki to describe what is technology, who uses technology, and what is it used for. And this definition, as mentioned, comes from a nine-year-old who said, technology is electricity that loves I'm just going to say that again, because that is the most poetic explanation of technology you will ever hear. Technology is electricity that loves. It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people use technology. Thank you very much. <laughs>